manual SQL injection for OSCP. I know that this is something to be really intimidating for a lot of people. And, and certainly when I first enrolled and everything, that was one of the things that I was like really worried about going into uh, the exam and, and things like that. Right. Because there's just a lot of potential um, things to contend with. Let's just say, right. You could have a number of different uh, database technologies, right? Like you MySQL, MS, SQL, Oracle, Postgres, you name it, right? Uh, not only that, who knows what the backend query is going to be. You're going to have to kind of piece that together uh, just by thinking about things logically and uh, enumerating as much as possible, right? Who knows what the database names are, the table names. There's a lot of stuff to enumerate in certain scenarios for sure. But I wanted to really distill all this stuff, break it down in the most simple element, and hopefully you guys can can uh, gather some you know positive takeaways here that's going to help you uh, with the exam, or maybe you just want to learn more about SQL injection. I mean, forget the exam, right? We're here to learn in general. So if you want to, if you want to, maybe SQL map is something you use all the time on your day to day job, and you just want to know more about what's happening. Uh, behind the scenes, right? What the manual stuff looks like. Now, one thing that you're going to notice about the PWK and OSCP specifically is a lot of times the machines on there are going to have some kind of roadblocker in place that's going to make it really inconvenient for you to use automated tools to exploit the SQL injection. Now, of course, if we're talking about the exam itself, uh, you're straight up not allowed to use SQL map. So there's that, right? So you're going to have to do, you're going to have to learn some manual SQL injection anyways. But even with the labs, that's one thing I've noticed is a lot of times it'll be really slow to use SQL map or something like that. So let's, let's just break down when is SQL a thing, right? When do you have to worry about SQL? That's the most important thing to understand first. So you're going to need to use or you know, you're going to want to think about exploiting a SQL injection vulnerability when the web application, let's get that out of the way, it is a web uh, application vulnerability, but specifically when the web application is talking to a database. So I guess the question then becomes, how do you know when it's talking to a database? Well, I mean, if I just go back to try hack me, right? Um, let, me, let me just pull that up for you guys. So try hack me. So here we go, right? Something like this um, login page, right? Obviously, that's going to talk to a database, right? Because a database is just used to store and retrieve data. So you create an account. Your account information is stored on their servers. And then when you go to log in, it you know, checks the database to see if your uh, username and hash password are correct. And if they are, then you get granted access, logged into your account. If not, then it sends you the error message, right? So a login page is one example of where SQL is used. What would be another area where it's used? Well, if we go into any of these tabs here and learn, right? Uh, all of these little categories, all these paths here have certain modules and stuff associated with them. Uh, that's data on the server, right? Chances are that um, they're using some kind of database to store all this content or links to the content basically, right? So, um, there's probably some kind of database involved somewhere here, right? So, for example, you know, for files and things like that, right? Like pr printing the certificate, usually you don't store entire files in a database, maybe a reference to them sometimes, but basically there's probably fields in the database that say, hey, this... Uh, lesson here is associated with this section and this section is associated with this learning path and things like that, right? So they're, they're related in some way. There's probably a database involved, all of that is to say. So, you know, even one, one column is probably the difficulty level, right? Uh, of like, you know, the machines. Because if we, if we look back here and just the last thing that I'm going to show you here before we move on is that right like with these different series that you have difficulty levels well that's probably a column in the database right so you have the WinCorp 
database entry. And one of the parameters, one of the columns is the difficulty level and the value of that is insane, right? And then there's a description column probably and you have this right here. So on and so forth, you get the idea, right? So that is basically what you're looking at with that. So going back, now it really depends. The reason that I explain this is it also really depends what the context is as for what kind of payload you're gonna use. So for example, if we have that basic login page, right? Username, password. And then what we're looking at really is um, a one common injection that's usually pretty uh, pretty useful for that would be something like um, something like this, right? You've probably seen this one before. The or one equals one. So so that's something that. Um, I'm not going to break down exactly what's happening here because it's going to take really, I could go really in depth with this basically, but basically what you're doing is breaking out of the previous SQL query. So there's some kind of query in the back end, like on the actual server, like select everything from uh, the users table, right? Users where username equals and then like whatever your user input is, right? and password equals uh, your user input. Something like this would be the backend query. So when you, when you insert this into here, let's say you inject in the username field, suddenly, um, let's say that there is, oops, something like this, right? So basically you're breaking out of the query here and then you're saying, or one equals one, that condition is always true. And this is a comment. So basically you can ignore the rest of this line as being commented out. So you're left with this, right? Select everything from users. Um, or one equals one is always true. So it's just gonna dump all the user information. Uh, usually if you do this on a login page, it's going to log you in as the first row in the database, which is usually the admin. Uh, there's ways to change that. If you do uh, a limit, you can actually have it log you in as the second uh, row in the database and third or th uh, third row, fourth row, so on and so forth, right? So there's ways to manipulate this to get it to log you in as a different user. But on a login page, this is usually, this or some variation of this is usually your go-to. Now, if the query is doing something else, uh, like um, giving you, let's say it's uh, retrieving some kind of data to display to you as the user. That's where you might want to look at something like a union injection. So union injections, I will say this right now, union injections are something you really want to, you really want to make sure you understand uh, because you see them all the time. Uh, I mean, you see the other one all the time too, but this is where the, like a lot of the CTFs and things you go up against that involve manual SQL injection are going to be really heavy on the union-based injections. So with union, and this is something that I would recommend researching. Uh, you could use like W3 schools or something like that. Just understand what the union is. It's a uh, command in SQL, basically. It's a keyword of in SQL. Basically, it joins multiple select statements together. Now, there's one important prerequisite for this. So with union injections or with, you, with the union statement, right? With union, both select statements must return the same number of columns. Okay? So that's really important. So you're not gonna be able to control the first select statement, right? It's gonna be happening on the back end. Let's say it returns three columns, then your when you do a union injection, right? So let's say that we inject something like uh, union select and union select one, two version, trying to get the version, right? The version of the database that's running. You do something like that, let's just say. So the only way that this union injection payload is going to work is that 
the previous statement has to return three columns. So there's a number of ways you can determine the number of columns. One is order by, the other one is just keep adding it until it doesn't give you an error saying that the column, no, the number of columns don't match, right? Now that's of course in the case that you have um, an error message you can read. If you don't, then you're gonna have to use a delay to confirm that. So basically you're gonna have to do something like, hey, if this condition is true, then sleep for five seconds and then return back to me or sleep for three seconds or whatever, right? It's just a little bit more hoops to jump through. It's a little bit more tedious, but even if you don't have an error message, you can still determine all of this stuff. You can still enumerate, but you're going to have to use delays. So that's something that's important to keep in mind. So something like this is going to be good to this will, what it will return is just the number one, number two, number three, number four, and then the version of the database it's running, right? So this is what we actually care about, but we had to pad it with this so that this is true, if that makes any sense to you guys. Now, depending on what database technology you're up against, you will have different things available to you. So if this is a MS SQL database, well, that kind of changes the built-in commands that I'm going to run. Maybe uh, I use something else here instead of add at version. I think MSSQL is add at version, but I might be wrong. What I normally do is I would just reference some kind of payload list online. Uh, payloads, all the things is pretty good for, uh, for this type of stuff. Different databases have a good cheat sheet on that that you can use. But basically, depending on what technology you're up against, for one thing, you're going to be using different built-in commands that are specific to that flavor of SQL. Uh, but another thing is that you might actually have different functionality available to you all together. So if, like I was saying, if this was an MS SQL server, I could do something like a XP command shell, XP underscore CMD shell, I believe, right? And then I could have like a, a command in here, right? I could have a command to spawn a reverse shell. And I could use that to get code execution potentially. Uh, if I, if it's my SQL, <clears throat> I usually, I typically won't have the ability to get code execution straight from that SQL injection, maybe indirectly through the SQL injection though, because my SQL has something called load file. So I could use load file to get an arbitrary file read on the operating system. So maybe I am able to read a configuration file that has hard-coded credentials, and then I can use those credentials to gain further access onto the uh, to the system, onto the, uh, maybe onto the web server, whatever the case may be. Maybe, th maybe there's an SSH key that I'm able to read as the user that this web server is running or the database is running as, right? So in that case, I could read their private key potentially. If SSH is available, then I can SSH into the server. So these are all things that you wanna be thinking about when you have that, you know, arbitrary file read, and of course, if you have code execution, then yeah, just go ahead and exploit that and get the initial shell, right? So, and, and you know, other databases are going to have different functionality available to them. A lot of this is kind of looking up and researching, and then the more you encounter certain technologies over and over again, you're going you're gonna to know this stuff, but definitely err on the side of taking heavy notes to begin with. So, Hopefully this gave you a good overview understanding because yeah, you, you could encounter anything on OSCP and in the real world, of course, the same remains. You could encounter anything, right? It could even be a NoSQL database <laughs> for all you know. So yeah, it's definitely good to just keep compounding on this knowledge, on this information, take notes along the way, as I say all the time. So if you're watching through that and you just really wanted like more granular information, you wanted like specifics, you wanted to really pick apart the SQL injection stuff, you know, see exactly how how to do and get hands-on practice, uh, really diving into manual SQL injection. Well, I, I'm happy to say I will be covering that in my upcoming course, The Art of Breaking Code. And not just manual SQL injection, we're also going to be covering a great deal, many more uh, topics in offensive cybersecurity, focused on the web app side of things, right? So with that being said, uh, the signups for that, if you're interested, we will be the first week of March. So Monday, it'll be starting Monday, February 28th, going all the way till Friday, 
March 4th. And I'll keep you guys posted for that, uh, both on the channel and uh, through email. And uh, I really look forward to seeing all you guys there. If you have any questions on that, of course, just let me know pretty much anywhere, comment section, Discord, whatever you guys prefer, and I'll get all those questions answered for you guys. But yeah, I'll see you guys right over in the videos on screen now. Thanks for watching.